I'm Nadine Thornhill, sexuality educator. Welcome to my recap and review of Handmaid's Tale Season 3, Episode 5, Unknown Color. The episode kicks off with the best thing ever, Luke holding a baby. Meanwhile in Gilead, June is at the supermarket patting herself on the back for performing miracles and remembering sexier times with Luke. Over at Lawrence Manor, Commander Lawrence is trying to make something happen with Eleanor by complimenting her hair. Fred invites Serena into the Commander's inner circle where she gets an update on Nicole's life in Canada. Canada. Why can't I say the name of my own country properly? Fred and Serena head over to Lawrence Manor where they ask June if she can set up a visit with Luke and baby Nicole. After some begging on Serena's part and some vague bargaining, June sets up the visit for the next day. Later, June and Eleanor hang out in the kitchen where they talk about music and boys. June then sneaks down to the Lawrence basement where she discovers Commander Lawrence's Dad Groove mixtapes. As Serena is packing for her visit to Canada, Rita comes in and gives her a package addressed to Luke. Serena flies to Toronto where she is reunited with cute white dude mediator Mark Twello. After changing into normal person clothes, Serena meets Nicole and Luke at the Toronto airport. Serena tries to appease Luke with her charms, but Luke's stank face is unwavering. Luke basically tells Serena, girl, you're not Nicole's mother, also you ain't shit. And I am here for all of this. Back at Lawrence Manor, Joseph and Eleanor are listening to those old mixtapes and trying to get some of that spark back. Luke is also listening to an old Joseph Lawrence mixtape, which contains a secret message from June. Serena returns to Gilead, and as soon as she steps off the plane, Fred is there to seduce her with a promise of getting Nicole back. Back at the supermarket, of Matthew confesses to June that she is pregnant with her fourth child. The eyes show up and take June away in their scary van. June is dropped off at a television studio where Aunt Lydia is waiting for her with a leveled up handmaid's uniform. June is forced to participate in a televised request from the Waterfords to Canada for Nicole's return to Gilead. The episode ends with a tight shot on June's stankiest stank face to date. Let's discuss this episode in detail. Before this season, didn't see Luke holding a lot of babies, so I was like, yeah, Luke, he is a handsome man. This season is full of Luke holding a baby, this episode in particular, so now I'm like, oh, okay, Luke is hot. More handsome black men holding babies in 2019, please. In the supermarket, we have some cinematography that we've never seen before. You know, we have June standing thinking while, you know, people and the scenery is whizzing by at, you know, double speed or triple speed or whatnot. And then in her flashback, that camera work is also very different. It's a lot more stylized. I also think that her flashback to Dancing with Luke may be the first time in the show that we've gotten just one flashback scene in an episode. They also had a very dramatic shot of the split peas being poured into a bag. I was wondering if the split peas were gonna factor into the episode in a significant way, but no, I think, you know, they're just like, these split peas are cool and we want you to take a moment to appreciate them, which I did. June is walking home, she's thinking about Luke and she thinks to herself, if I thought I would never get to touch him again, I would die. When June first started sleeping with Nick, I remember her either saying or thinking that she couldn't remember Luke clearly anymore. I'm wondering if seeing him in the video has now brought him back into focus and so he's on her mind a lot more and she's a lot more aware of just how much she misses him and how much she misses being with him. I've talked a lot in previous recaps about the fact that Gilead just seems to be a lot more relaxed. I don't need to keep harping on the same point, so I'm just from here on out gonna call this Gilead 2.0. As I mentioned in the last recap, Gilead 1.0 would have seen the video of Luke and Nicole in Canada and June would have been up on the wall. But in Gilead 2.0, they're like, oh, you're kidnapped babies in Canada with your husband? Yeah, sure, okay, nothing to see here, just keep it moving. I really enjoy awkward, love-struck Commander Lawrence. Your, your hair, like, it looks nice, like, 
it did before. Not that your hair doesn't normally look nice, I'm just saying, like, uh, 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 uh. Oftentimes in TV, when we have characters who are very self-assured, they're always self-assured, and that's not realistic. Everyone has moments of insecurity or has aspects of their lives or certain relationships where they don't feel as secure. I think it's nice that we got to see that aspect of Commander Lawrence's personality. There are so many Toronto landmarks in this episode, some that are meant to be in Toronto proper and then others that are filling in for places in Gilead. So the first one that I recognized was during the commander's meeting and it takes place in a building in downtown Toronto called the Carlou. It's considered one of Toronto's best preserved buildings from the Art Deco era. I actually was going to have my wedding in this building, but then I didn't because I didn't have like a hundred grand to spend on a wedding venue. I was actually wanting to have it in the round room. That is the room where they filmed um, like the actual commander's meeting and they had that round desk. There's a structure in the middle of that desk. That is actually a very beautiful fountain. If you have a hundred grand and you, are, you wanna have an event and you're in Toronto, I suggest the Carlou. Speaking of Canada, Canada in the show, or at least Toronto, is crawling with Gilead spies. They have Nicole's medical records. They have Luke's employment info. That is super private information. So either spies, like spies everywhere, or Gilead has some hackers who have been cracking into some Canadian computers. I've been assuming that Luke just sort of has Nicole. Now that I think about it, he must have some kind of legally recognized guardianship. And now I'm very curious about how that works. So I'm probably gonna go research that after I finish filming this. If you happen to know um, what would happen in Canada if an infant arrived in the country without their parents or legal guardians, what would happen, what would typically happen to that infant? Uh, let me know down in the comments. During the scene at Lawrence Manor where Fred and Serena show up and they ask June to you know, help them arrange this visit with Nicole, Serena gets kind of desperate. She talks to June alone. She says to her, I am begging you. Let us take a look back to season one when June begged begged Serena to see Hannah. Mrs. Waterford, please. Please, let me see her. Let me help. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Please. Please. No. 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 Alfred, you need to listen to me. Please. Please take me back. Please. I have to see her. Please. That's not going to be good for anybody. She is a beautiful girl, Alfred. And she's happy. And she's well taken care of. And you don't have to worry about anything. Listen to me. As long as my baby is safe, so is yours. It's freaking infuriating. June relents on the condition that Serena will owe her. June, that isn't anything. I want you to work on your negotiating skills because they are not sharp. You're not getting nothing from Serena Joy. I promise you that. Also, Waterfords, are y'all actually serious about this phone call and this visit? Because if you were, you would make sure that the number you're calling from is associated with a name. You have forgotten how to cell phone. Of course, Luke did not pick up the phone the first time. If that had been me, I wouldn't have picked up the phone at all. So you got lucky the actual phone call wrecked me. This is the first time June and Luke have spoken in what it's probably been at least five years now. Luke is on one end and you know just all the emotion and pain and his desperation you know to be with June to find her to find Hannah just comes spilling out and then June doesn't even get that. She doesn't even get any catharsis in this phone call because She's surrounded by the Waterfords and Commander Lawrence. She does not have the luxury of really letting herself process any of the emotion because she's not, she's not in a situation where it's 
safe or even possible for her to break down, which she will if she lets herself acknowledge the magnitude of what just happened and the magnitude of everything she's lost. It just really hit me how badly they miss each other and that they should be together and they're just not. After the phone call, June goes up to her room. She needs a moment. I notice her room at the Lawrence's is very similar to her room at the Waterford's. She has an ensuite bath. Is having a spare room with an ensuite bath like a requirement for getting a handmaid? Is that why, for example, the Mackenzies didn't get a handmaid, they got Hannah instead? They were like, well, we have a spare room but the bathroom's down the hall. Gilead was like, then no, you, you fail the handmade application. We're just going to give you this older child. Her name is Hannah. Change her name to Agnes because you're awful. We have a scene with Eleanor and June in the Lawrence kitchen and they are sharing a moment. They're confiding in each other. I think that Part of the reason that June and Eleanor are able to connect in this way and speak as friends, or at least in a friendly, supportive way, is because the ceremony doesn't happen in the Lawrence household. When you are participating in rape with your partner, I think that's gonna drive a wedge between everybody, and that wedge does not exist there between Eleanor and June. So. Yeah, they can, they can kind of lean on each other, which I like. June is very good in these relationship conversations. She's good at holding space and acknowledging what the person is going through. We saw that last season with Eden, even though ultimately Eden ran away and then she got drowned in a pool, but that wasn't June's fault. That was Eden's horrible family's fault and Gilead in general. June goes down to the basement. She finds Commander Lawrence's mixtapes. He made a lot of mixtapes back in the day. Like that was clearly his thing. And she turns it on and it is Leo Sayer. Ah! I love me a dad groove. I love you make me feel like Vanson. It's weird that I have the same taste in music as Commander Lawrence, but whatever, Hulu. Where's my Commander Lawrence Spotify playlist? I need it. In another scene, we see Serena at her mother's home. She is packing up for her trip to Canada. She's in a teal outfit in a room that is painted teal, putting photographs into a teal billfold kind of thing. As a wife, is Serena forbidden from having things that aren't teal? Teal is actually one of my favorite colors. I'm just saying, it's a lot. Rita comes in, she hands Serena this package that says, for Luke. I, and I know I am not alone in this, as a fan of the show, I want more Rita. I, I have never heard a fan of the show say, what we want is less Rita, more Rita. Here's the thing about Serena, she is a trifling motherfucker, but her eyebrows, they are magnificent. Let's talk about, Fred for a moment. I don't think that he cares about Nicole at all. I don't think that he is sad or bothered by the fact that she is in Canada instead of with him. Fred gets off on white knighting because that allows him to delude himself into thinking that he is a good guy. None of this is for Serena. None of this is for his not daughter Nicole. This is all for his own weak ego. Fred is the worst. Not you, Joseph Fiennes, you are not the worst. You are a very fine actor, and whenever I have heard you in interviews, you always speak very respectfully. I'm just talking about Fred, the character. He's the worst. You're playing him really well, because it's hard to play someone who is the literal worst. Serena gets into the barest of barebone planes. She arrives in Canada, she is greeted by Mark Tuello. He did not bring her treason and coconuts, but he has gone shopping and bought her some fine clothes. She's rocking this pink sweater coat, and Yvonne Schakowsky is tall enough that she can wear one of those long sweaters and look chic, unlike me, who is shorter and when I wear one, I just look like a six-year-old dressed up in her father's bathrobe. Je suis jalouse. Mark introduces Serena to Luke and he's holding the baby. The baby loves him so much. 
She's sleeping on him. She's all happy. It's amazing. And I'm like, Serena, go away. You're ruining what would otherwise be a perfect, perfect moment. Luke, you're wonderful. Baby's wonderful. But seriously, where is your diaper bag though? Serena is like, bless you. Luke is all, fuck you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke, for holding a baby and saying what I have been thinking this entire series. Fuck you, Serena. But first tell me who did your eyebrows. Luke asks Serena if June is okay, and Serena says, yes, she's been reassigned. It's the way um, I would answer if somebody said, you know, how's your son doing? And I said, oh great, he's about to enter middle school. Serena has forgotten that assigning June to a man sounds screwed up to Luke because it's screwed up. She is so deep into Gilead. Like she's borderline delusional at this point. Luke says to Serena, you're not her mother. And she replies like, well, you're not her father. And this is not about biology. It's not about biology. It's about kidnapping. You're a kidnapper. Also, Serena says something like, every child has a right to their story, which I mean is some bullshit because you're denying all the kidnapped kids of Gilead their story, but what else? Mike, real question is, Serena, do you really want Nicole to know how you factor into her story? Really? Also that locket from her dad is in a teal jewelry box. All of her stuff is teal. She must be so shocked to be sitting there in an outfit that is like pink and beige and denim. Then Luke offers, he offers to let her hold the baby. She didn't even ask. Don't let her hold the baby. But if you go back and watch that scene, when she goes to take Nicole, Nicole kind of like tries to punch her with her little baby fist. I love that little baby actor. The baby's literally like, mm. It's awesome. We see Serena back on the plane. We get a glimpse inside her handbag, which is not teal. There you go, Serena, mixing it up. There is a cell phone, or maybe it's a satellite phone, and there is a note, presumably, from Mark Twello that says, if you ever need me. I am wondering if this is, you know, Chekhov's satellite phone and it's going to factor back in later in the season. I have to imagine it would. Serena deplanes, Fred is right there waiting for her. He asked her how it was. She's like, she was perfect. Now it's over. As they hug, Fred's like, it doesn't have to be. God damn it, Fred. Why is literally everything you do wrong and stupid? We have another scene at the grocery store and what are these jars of horror that June and of Matthew are standing in front of? I really feel for of Matthew in this scene. She is expecting her fourth child and she seems really, really just thrown by the entire situation. It's one thing to know that a situation is going to be painful. It's another to know that a situation is going to be painful because you've already been through that situation three times and you know exactly how and how intensely painful it's going to be. I think she's really scared. The silver lining though is that of Matthew is probably going to get the district's handmaid of the month award. She fertile as hell. Do all the guardians know all the handmaids by sight? They're not asking any questions. They spot June, they're immediately like, of oh, Joseph, you're coming with us. Just like that. When June climbs up into the van, we see she has her little shopping bag. So that means that the guardians were at least courteous enough to let her check out before they drove her away. Where did Luke get a Walkman? I'm not sure if this is on the writers or if it's on the editors. I feel like this episode needed another scene so that we know how that tape got from June to Rita, to Serena, to Luke. I said in an earlier review that if my partner was separated from me and in a Gilead type situation, and he needed a romantic slash sexual relationship to survive and get through it relatively intact, mentally speaking, that I would want that, but that I would probably also be hurt, likely jealous. Again, I really, really felt for Luke in this scene to 
learn the truth about this baby, this baby that he loves now. It must simultaneously be a relief, but intensely painful to hear that, you know, June loved someone else. O.T. Fagbenle's face acting in this, it was Elizabeth Moss level face acting. I think he's a very talented actor overall. I think he is especially good when he is simply silently listening and reacting. It was the same in the airport scene. I mean, the words were cutting and biting, but like his face, you could see everything that he was thinking and feeling. I was also thrilled that in her recording, June told Luke that Nicole's real name is Holly. I have nothing against the name Nicole. I actually quite like it. I just did not like it in the context of the show and, you know, the baby's relationship to Nick and it being the name Serena chose. I thought Holly was a much better choice. So from now on, I'm going to call her Holly. In order to differentiate from June's mom, Holly, I will call them Mama Holly and Baby Holly. Or maybe Holly Sr. and Holly Jr. We'll see, I have not decided yet. Scary Van pulls up to a television studio. Aunt Lydia is backstage. She brings in some fancy new handmaid's duds for June. June walks onto a set meant to resemble the Waterfords parlor and there are the Waterfords. They are back on their bullshit. They are broadcasting a message to the Canadians. Who in Canada is broadcasting this message? Is it the CBC? Is it UCBC? Did you do this? I expect better from you. Now I'm going to nitpick on behalf of my partner because he picked up on this and I didn't. One of his peeves in TV shows and movies is when a character runs in like Moira did and is like, turn on the TV. The thing is just starting and therefore the person who ran in couldn't possibly have seen it if it just started. And that does happen in this scene and it aggravated him and I just wanted to make it known and put it on the record because I get it, that's not realistic. Luke and Moira are watching this broadcast. They look shook. Luke is holding the baby again. The baby looks shook. Well done, little baby actor, baby actor twins. You're good. I understand why they hired you. Meanwhile, in the studio, June stank face is at DEF CON 4. And I'm like, really Fred? Is this what you wanna do? Do you wanna get June slapped again? Because you're cruising for a June bruising. If this was Gilead 1.0, the Waterfords would not be messing with her and bringing her into the studio. They would have hung her ass or had her sent to the colonies. This is Gilead 2.0. So June is gonna survive all of this and just be all up in their faces about this treachery. And that is my recap and review of episode five. In the comments below, let me know what you think is going to happen next. Do you think that Serena is just fooling all of us and she's really on the good side? I don't, but I could be wrong. I actually hope I am wrong about Serena Joy. I hope that she comes around in the end because I prefer people to not be awful. That's all for now. I hope you have a great day and I will see you soon. Bye.